Hello, welcome back to greentv.com, where I am so proud and pleased and honored to do a series called Meet the Solutionaries. I interview scientists, politicians, activists, filmmakers, authors, business people, clean tech, green biz, you name it. Um, but most of all, scientists, because they are the ones who are telling us what's happening um, and increasingly with in alarming tones appropriately and louder and more often. I don't know if you, our viewers, um, heard about the IPCC report that was released this week. You may not have because there was, of course, and is so much other news and Ukraine, uh, the war in Russia, Ukraine, whatever you want to call it, genocide, it's horrendous, um, is appropriately taking up a lot of space, but uh, it's not okay to just keep bumping the climate news off to the side because of course, mother nature is not waiting till we get our act together and uh, can cover it appropriately. So that's what we'd like to do here. I am very honored to introduce you to two climate scientists who are new to me. I've read their quotes in uh, various publications, but very honored to have uh, Peter Saucer, who is with the um, University of uh, Arizona and Arizona State University. They have a fabulous program there. I just keep hearing about all the great work you're doing in sustainability and climate change and recycling and all my favorite green topics. You are the director of the Global Futures Laboratory. You just opened up recently and you've got a great Earth Day program coming up with lots of great topics and speakers. And um, before we wrap up, please let our viewers know where they can find out more about that, especially if they can participate remotely. Also, you've probably seen him on MSNBC, CNN, other networks. I certainly have Daniel Swain, another esteemed climate scientist from UCLA, another esteemed academic institution. Uh, you are with the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability Department. And I could go on many credentials here, but I want to jump right in because there's so much to talk about. So this latest report, Antonio Guterres, uh, UN Secretary General, seems to be needing increasingly alarming language to <laughs> get people's attention. Uh, the first one, I think back in August, it was last year, um, Code Red for Humanity, the second one was um, delay is deaf, as far as the takeaway message, at least the messages that I can't get out of my head. And mo most recently, it's now or never. And uh, he said the world is perilously close to tipping points that could lead to cascading and irreversible consequences. And he listed, or there were five areas listed, and we're going to delve into them, especially because our scientists have expertise in these areas in particular. Of course, our Amazon rainforest, uh, the fear is that it could become a dry savanna. Uh, Daniel's going to speak to that. Also, coral reefs, as we've heard, are dying. The six, we just had another one, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, a big die off. Uh, the coral are reportedly being cooked to death. Um, we have ice sheets that are melting. We just had a big one, I don't know if you'd call it drop, fall, melt. Uh, in the, and, and it's also very much happening in Greenland as well as the Antarctic. And, there's all kinds of um, ominous um, uh, predictions about what will happen if it continues to melt at the rate we're seeing it. Also, uh, this one is really scary and not talked about enough. The Atlantic circulation, um, the whole, our jet streams, the currents, uh, we're, we're actually, we humans are having an impact on that and could be quite catastrophic. If we don't uh, reverse course, it could lead to an ice age in Europe. Uh, of course, we're talking about sea level rise already, but it could get that much more dramatic you know, along the East Coast, very populated areas like New York, Boston. And the last one, which I'd not heard about, at least explained in these terms, the snow forest disappearing uh, from heat and fire and um, park beetle disease affecting trees. Uh, I didn't really know about snow forests. I guess that's talking about the Boreal and other areas that are maybe not so familiar to Americans. So that's a long enough uh, introduction. What was actually, um, you know, we, we developing and, and is highlighted in that report is that we are at this point, in my view, beyond the level of 1.5 degrees at which we wanted to hold global warming. I think it, it's getting less and less likely looking at the trajectories that we are on, that we can stop global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. We simply did not meet the requirements that were laid out in the Paris Accord in 2015 and then in the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees warming about two years ago, that actually told us what we would have to do to stay in that uh, temperature range, which the main two things are that by 2030, we would have to cut roughly in half the emissions of greenhouse gases. The other one, 
is that by roughly the middle of the century, 2050, three decades from now, we have to be at uh, carbon net zero or net zero carbon. And if we are looking at the emission scenarios that we have, the, the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere that are, of course, a direct consequence of that, we are simply not on the trajectory that we can hold that. We, something really substantive beyond what I think is easily imaginable would have to happen to get to get back on that track. We would have had to cu start cutting CO2 emissions by about six, seven percent per year starting in 2021. And even with the fact that we came out of uh, the pandemic where we saw some reductions for a short period of time, we did not meet that goal. I'm almost certain that in 2022 we will not meet it then you can see that you know the, the the percentage per year is increasing and we we are we are really running out of time in my view we have now to focus on the 2 degrees celsius with the committed contributions of the ndc's nationally determined contributions to the reductions right now we are on a trajectory of 3.2 degrees celsius warming rather than 1.5 to less than two. To me, that is one of the major messages that is being brought home, not just by that report, but it highlights it. It was building up even in the in the report that came out a few months ago from Working Group Two. There was already discussion among many of the of my colleagues that I know saying that they personally feel that 1.5 had slipped away. Yeah, I think to echo that, I think that. There, there is a broad consensus in the climate community at, at this point that the 1.5 degree global temperature target is very, very likely to be exceeded. Uh, and that it's going to be a real challenge, uh, two degrees even, uh, is still a, a, a very high challenge um, that we are nowhere near on a trajectory to meet at this point. Um, but it is worth commenting on why we are still, uh, or why we are sort of realizing that some of these optimistic targets from some years ago are, are appearing increasingly unreachable. And it's not because the climate system has necessarily itself behaved differently than we had predicted. It's because human activities, human emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere um, have been, have, have continued to increase uh, at a time when we had assumed, or at least hoped, uh, they would rapidly begin to decrease. So humans and, have not responded as you'd predicted and hoped in terms of the alarm. <laughs> yes, essentially, it's a question, you know, it's a question of, of, of humans and society not making the changes that we would have need to have made to be on, be on a better trajectory. Um, and I think it's worth emphasizing this for two reasons. One, something I often hear is this notion that we've hit a, a global point of no return. The warming is somehow self-sustaining and increasing on its own accord, and that therefore there's nothing we can do about it. Whereas the reality is actually quite the opposite. The reason why we are having this escalating crisis is we're keeping our foot on the accelerator. So it's not that the brakes don't work, it's that we're choosing not to use the brakes. And I think that that's important, you know, for what we think about moving forward about this. This is this is not an unsolvable problem, but the problem is we're, we're choosing not to solve it. And so it's a different kind of solution space than if we were just going to throw up our hands and say it's too late. We give up. There's nothing we can do about it, because the reality is we can still do everything about it. But the longer we wait to do it, the worse the outcomes are going to be and the harder it is going to be to achieve any particular desirable outcome. And so, and I think that's relevant in the case of these, these, these tipping points that we talk about, because, you know, in, in a planetary system, whether it's the Amazon rainforest or the North Atlantic overturning circulation or anything else, we don't necessarily know where those tipping points lie. We don't know exactly how much global warming it's going to take to exceed those important planetary thresholds. Uh, we may be very close right now with some of them, or we may be very far away still. But the fact that we don't know that um, is pretty concerning given the, what the consequences of hitting really any one of these would be uh, for the planet and for us humans. And I just wanna follow up on that, uh, Daniel, before we go to you, Peter, uh, what would putting the brakes on look like? 
<laughs> and no small question, I know, but well, you know, it's it's no small question. Although in 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 very broad terms, it is actually there is a simple answer to that. We, eventually, um, and sooner rather than later, the amount of the, the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that's that's out of sync with the ability of the Earth's capacity to uh, bring that carbon back out of the atmosphere, um, those net human emissions need to go to zero as soon as possible, not just level off, not just decrease. If we just level off, as we sort of have recently, where there's, you know, there, the emissions are still increasing, but at a slower rate than they used to be, uh, that's nowhere near enough. In fact, it wouldn't even be enough if they were slowly decreasing, because what the atmosphere actually feels is the total amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So any increase in that amount, even if it, it's a decreasing increase over time, is still going to lead to continued global warming, still going to push us closer to whatever these, the, these planetary tipping points, wherever they may be. With each increment of warming, we get closer to them. And so in broad, in broad terms, the solution is to bring global carbon emissions close to zero as soon as possible. In practical terms, of course, that is easier said than done. Although we do have, uh, you know, today, essentially all of the technology that we would need to do that. It's really a matter of uh, political and societal will to actually solve the problem. Yes, and Peter. Well, I, I actually wanted to, to comment on that. Daniel is right that we have options to counter the present trend and it is societal will as i often also shorthanded that prevents us from from going there we in essence know how to transform the energy system we even see that alternative energy renewable energy is cheaper than some of the energy that we produce in the conventional way which is heavily based on burning fossil fuels we also know in principle how to take carbon back out of the atmosphere so the options are in front of us the key question then is why are humans not picking them up and that includes individual choices but also choices of groups nations global society and i think in part it is that people you know we, we are creatures of habit we think that if we have to make different choices than the ones we made that got us into that predicament, that we will sacrifice without really defining exactly what that sacrifice would be. But there is that fear that things would be, we would be worse off if we are not making different choices. The truth is that we actually might be much better off making different choices right now. And in fact, you could say, if we are not making different choices, we might move towards the ultimate sacrifice, which is that the planet will start to self-regulate and our options to determine and shape our future will be minimized. And that is and coming back to, you know, wh where is that point and what Daniel said, we don't exactly know where these thresholds are, often called tipping points, but we know that they are out there. They might not be that far away. I often say it feels like we, we have pushed our planet deep into the buffer zone, not just in climate, but also in climate. It feels like driving a car on red, not knowing how big our reserve tank is. Mm. And that is a very uncomfortable situation to be in. And typically we react to that when we are in the car. But here, because it is a little bit more abstract, we don't see it like that. We, we, we still hope, many of, of the people hope, that there is that little bit of time that, well, you know, things did not fall apart altogether yeah. during the past 10, 20, 50 years since we are talking about it. So let's just see if we can drive it a little bit further, not knowing that, yes, the system, you know, might let us go a little bit further. But at this point, we are actually in the danger zone and we, we have absolutely no time left. And, and when people say that, though, and I don't have to tell you experts that, you know, it, it's not off in the distance, we're already seeing the impacts. I mean, look at the coral reefs dying off, look at biodiversity dying off, look at the extreme weather. I mean, you know, how can you not see it? It's here now. And if we're still not taking the action needed, like, my goodness, um, what do you think it will take? I hate to say that because, 
you know, one would have thought that what we've already experienced just in the last five years, if not 10 to 15, would be enough. Um, uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's a, a question for, you know, psychology, sociologists, as well as, you know, climate scientists. But uh, gosh, we're really up against it. And it, you, one has to wonder just what's it going to take. And we, we are actually, we, we do know that some psychologists are actually engaging in that question. Quite a few of them, also humanists. And what what part of the debate is what are we reacting to most effectively and it is a little bit a battle of effective versus rational decision making and effective decision making which is reacting to our short-term needs like daily life you know putting food on the table keeping the car going getting the, the kids to school things like that that often wins out over our decision making that has to do with the long term the more abstract the things where we feel we have more time left and but increasingly colleagues in academia but also you know outside academia and research institutions are focusing on understanding decision making as a key part of what we have to to do to understand how does the brain translate into a mind into behavior into decision making and how does that actually work how can it be incentivized to move from the present trajectory into one that is more compatible with what the planet has to offer we made a choice a while ago to live on a planet that is at least 10 times bigger than the one that we have well we that that turns out that as you point out is not the case and the planet is showing us that we are on the wrong track by displaying to us the negative effects wildfires bigger hurricanes stalling hurricanes sea level rise i mean we could go through all the things that you have mentioned at the beginning Th these are signs that we see more frequently closer to us in more forms at higher amplitudes but they still have not yet managed to get the collective will turned around to a faster action. Of course, the fossil fuel industry has um, contributed to that um, confusion, if you will, deliberately. Um, mainstream media has certainly not treated environmental news and climate change with proper proportional respect. I mean, I think of the there are multiple different kinds of tipping points and just to define tipping points really meaning a, a change in, in a, a system uh, in, in the earth system where uh, the behavior after reaching that point is significantly different than the behavior of the system before that point so it's not just incremental change you push it a little more and it changes a little more it push it a little more it changes a little more at some point in some of these systems you push it a little more and it changes a lot so that's what a tipping point fundamentally is um, and, you know, there are different kinds of, of, of tipping points, both in the physical system. So the, the ocean and the atmosphere and the cryosphere being the, the Earth's ice covered surfaces themselves and in the biosphere. So the living part of the Earth that includes all of the ecosystems that exist, plus us humans. And, you know, in my head, there are, there are these sort of two classes of tipping points, some of which can really affect the whole planet, where if you if you hit one of these thresholds, it doesn't just change things in that particular system or locally or regionally, but across the whole world. And there are other ones that are a little bit more localized, but can be regionally uh, devastating. And so, you know, from that perspective, in my head, there are really three that stand out as being particularly concerning due to a combination of the fact that they would have global consequences and also that we are either potentially quite close to them or we really have no idea how close we are to them. Those top three would be the rapid loss of the continental ice sheets. So these would be the ice sheets in Greenland and, and uh, Antarctica as well, which would result in, in much more rapid sea level rise than it's currently being projected and that would affect uh, billions of people who live along the Earth's coastlines very quickly. Um, there is the potential dieback of the Amazon rainforest, whereby um, a, a drying and warming of that of that rainforest essentially initiates a self-reinforcing feedback loop, where uh, the forest, which historically generates a lot of its own rainfall by re-evaporating moisture into the atmosphere and raining back out again, once you start to lose 
enough of that forest, uh, you don't get as much rain, which means you lose more of the forest and you get even less rain and you lose even more of the forest until the point where you don't necessarily have a forest anymore at all. You might have a savanna, so grassland with, with trees mixed in, and that has global consequences because of what it means for the carbon cycle. The tropical rainforests sequester a tremendous amount of carbon at present, and if they collapse, they won't do so in the future. That's all carbon that would enter the atmosphere and cause, you guessed it, more global warming. And the other, the third one that I think you know, particularly concerns me are potential for feedbacks uh, in the Arctic carbon cycle as well. So these might arise from the thawing of permafrost, for example, and the increased microbial activity that occurs in these newly thawed soils and, and marshes and peatlands. And also the fact that we're now seeing large wildfires, even north of the boreal forests. Siberia? <laughs> in, in Siberia. So not only are we seeing more of the, these boreal forest fires, which can themselves release a lot of carbon when those, when those trees burn in, across vast acreages, but we're also seeing fires and, and methane emissions uh, in the Arctic tundra. So places even farther to the north that were historically even colder than the boreal forests are seeing even more rapid changes. And that's sort of an emerging potential tipping point that wasn't even really being talked about all that much five or 10 years ago, but it's really jumped forward ahead of some of the other ones that were being talked about five or 10 years ago as one that really might have significant implications um, in, you know, in the coming decades. And in addition to the permafrost, which is not permanent anymore, um, melting and releasing greenhouse gases, there's also been concern about releasing viruses. Maybe that's what you're referring to. Is that a, a real world, world problem? Something else we should um, lay awake at night thinking about <laughs> and maybe doing something about? Well, there is, of course, the question about how does the, the biosphere change and what does that mean for disease vectors and for, for viruses? And even in the, in the COVID, discussion there was uh, quite a bit of discussion was that related to, to climate so th there were certain things that we know there are certain things that I think we are still they're still relatively speculative but on these thresholds that, that Daniel mentioned and the ones that you um, you know listed at the beginning one was the um, Atlantic or the original overturning circulation some people shorthand that with the Gulf Stream and it is, of course, linked to freshwater input from high latitudes, which is increasing because of warming. There is an interesting point. Some people still say that will get us to an ice age. If we wouldn't have the global warming, that would be one possible scenario. In fact, if you are just looking at the past few million of years, we went from warm period to ice age to warm period. And there's this regular cycle of about 100,000 years. And we, in essence, would slowly move towards if you know we wouldn't put a lot of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere towards a cooler planet if this cycle would continue. But what, in all likelihood, will happen with the uh, with a slowing meridional overturning circulation or a slowing Gulf Stream, if you wish in, to use that language, is that less heat is being transported into the northern uh, North Atlantic, Labrador Sea, Irminger Sea, across the North Atlantic current towards Norway. That's what a lot of people say regulates the climate of, of northern, uh, of the northern hemisphere of Europe mainly. But because we have a counter effect, so if some of that heat is not coming up, we have that counter effect of warming from the atmosphere. So what in all likelihood we will see is less warming over parts of the northern hemisphere rather than slipping back to temperatures below the average that we had before we put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So I think it uh, we, we have to be a little bit careful that we are not going overboard with these things I, and, and slipping into an ice age in my view is, is highly unlikely. Most likely, what we will see is a, is a dampening of the warming over the North Atlantic. So that's one of these um, 
you know, features that we are seeing that are contemplating what do they mean? I'm more worried about what does a change in the internal dynamics of a major part of the ocean mean for ocean dynamics, for the biology, the ecosystems that are related to that and the interaction with the, with the land. So that that is something where we have to pay quite a bit of attention to. But the fear going towards an ice age, in, in my mind, is, is very, I mean, it might be a little bit uh, overdone. Personally, I feel we, we will not get there. We, we just will offset some of the warming. Okay, we'll take yeah, that. Absolutely. You've got still plenty to worry about. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I would absolutely agree from an atmospheric and oceanic dynamics perspective. Um, it's not to say that the consequences of a large change in the North Atlantic uh, overturning circulation or the Gulf Stream wouldn't have huge impacts, but I think a lot of folks think to uh, say the, the movie The Day After Tomorrow, where everything just plunges into Arctic freeze. Um, and the, I think one of the things that's missed in this is that we've already warmed the earth in the warm direction by about as much as it would cool in the cold direction during an ice age. So perhaps if there hadn't been global warming, then yes, something like that could, okay. could plunge us into an ice age, but that is not going to happen because we've already warmed the earth too much for that to happen in the future. And the additional component to that is the North Atlantic overturning circulation, um, as was just mentioned, primarily uh, affects the temperatures in, in Europe. Um, so it's actually plausible that if you did see a large disruption to that ocean's overturning circulation, you might see, as was mentioned, less warming in Europe, but much more warming across the rest of the planet in the meantime. So the Southern Hemisphere, North America, would probably warm at an even faster rate than they would have otherwise, even as Europe has uh, dramatically more muted changes. And of course, changing those patterns and those temperature differentials would greatly affect uh, weather patterns and extreme storms and things like that. So I think the concern there is less that it would get colder rather than it would really just throw a wrench into almost everything. Um, some places would warm even faster. You'd get more extreme weather in other places. Um, but you know that's one of those tipping points that we really don't, we're not, a, we know it, it can happen since there's precedent for it in the Earth's geologic history. But are we particularly close to it? We don't know. And, and it may not even act as a tipping point this century. Although if it obviously, if it did, then it would be a big deal. And I think that this kind of, this, this notion keeps coming back with all of these conversations and all of these tipping points, which is that Uncertainty is not our friend in this respect. Uh, it's not. It's not good news that we we might not experience these things. I, I would instead frame it as alarming. Even if there's only a ten or a twenty percent chance of hitting some of these, as the case may be, that's a very large number uh, given the consequences. Um, if you knew that there was a twenty percent chance that the plane you were getting on was going to crash, would you get on the plane? I don't even like getting on one if I don't know. <laughs> I'm a nervous flyer, so definitely not. Um, and, and you know, the, the, those parties or interests that would want to diminish concern about climate change or even outright denial, you know, they often say, well, there's confusion. All the evidence isn't in, although they haven't said that as much. There must have been a new talking point, you know, now about, you know, what, what is it that, uh, well, it may be caused by humans, but there's not much we can do about it. We need to let the market take over. Like, just because we don't know, 100% of what's going to happen, science never does. That's no reason at all to, I mean, there's plenty of evidence of what is already here, right? So the societal lack of response, I guess, is is mind blowing, really, isn't it not? I mean, do you lie awake at night? Like, um, I mean, I would imagine you do, because you know more than I do, and I do. <laughs> but that, that's true. But if you if you look at the, the just the question that you raised about uncertainty, and that you know, was building on what, what Daniel said, I would claim that a lot of our scientific projections, although they have an error envelope, these error envelopes are much smaller than those around factors around which we make economic decisions or political decisions. We, we have actually quite well defined error envelope on many of the, of the projections that, that we have. So in my view, that's not an excuse to say, oh, you know, there is there is a lot of dispute. Yes, as, as in everything, there are sometimes voices that don't agree with, let's say, even IPCC. 
but you know ipcc has such a large input and the consensus is is really high and it is a continuous pro uh, process it's not a one-off assessment and then you move on it is continuing to refine it and by now i think we have actually a fairly good picture of where the system is heading under different uh, driving scenarios under different scenarios of let's say greenhouse gas uh, emissions so in my view there there is no excuse to say science doesn't have it right so we can wait until they get it right that that is really uh in in my view that that is a, a very dishonest approach to the situation that we are facing we we are seeing some of the effects we have clear evidence that many of the projections that were done in the 80s or even before are within reasonable error envelopes are playing out right now we know that we have warmed the planet by roughly one degree celsius coming back to what daniel said the temperature difference between a glacial period and a warm period from which we started before putting co2 into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases was about five degrees celsius roughly 10 fahrenheit so we are 20 percent of a full swing of into the warmer world another one degree celsius is almost certainly baked in that would be 40 percent so now now you're half of a full cycle of a glacial into the wrong direction that should give us pause and should say well even if we don't know it exactly let's just take out some insurance policy coming back to the example with the plane <laughs> would you would you actually fly something or would you drive a car when you have a chance of 10 20 30 percent of of a major thing so so if if nothing else let's make sure that we that we ensure ourselves against catastrophes and this this is something you know people often ask when when i talk about these things well one degree celsius two degree celsius i have day night night uh, swings of 10 celsius 20 celsius and, and then you have to really get back to saying you, you have to really average that and during the last ice age new york city there was about one kilometer of ice over it so th this this is not just tinkering out around the edge we are playing with the planet on a big scale with really significant and severe outcomes that will change life as we know it and already is happening and and so some of the you hear this debate back and forth one and a half we keep it to two i almost want to scream and you guys are the experts i'm just like a, a mother who worries about her you know children's future um and future grandchildren you know okay doesn't matter we're, we're way past where we should be and let's just focus on what we can do now you as scientists are not necessarily the ones responsible for saying what we can do but what would you like to see happen that would just as much as we can slow this runaway train and you know we have to cut our emissions in half by 2030 that's eight years from now and we're not we're not on that track. We're going the opposite direction. Uh, what, what, if you were president or God, what would you make happen as quickly as possible? Well, I think fundamentally, uh, fundamentally, we, we really just have to make it very easy for people to make good decisions about the climate. It, it, it can't be structured as people need to make individual sacrifices because that won't even work anyway. It, it, it won't scale up because it's not currently possible to make good enough choices on an individual level for the vast majority of people. What we need to do is make it so that societal systems uh, make it more difficult than not uh, to do things uh, that, that, that harm the climate. So you know, the examples of this are you know, right now in lots of large American cities, there is no realistic way for a lot of people, especially uh, on the lower end of the income scale, to get to their work other than driving a personal vehicle because public transit networks are in shambles or just non-existent. They never even existed in the first place in a lot of places. So, for example, there, there may not be a realistic alternative for those folks right now, but what we need to do is make it so that not only is there a realistic alternative, but it's both easier, cheaper, and more appealing to use it than to continue to drive your car to work every day. That's just a very almost mundane example, but we need to do that 
with agriculture, with food systems, with transportation, and building electrification, just about everything. That's the broad scale solution. It's not asking people to stop using energy. It's not asking people to uh, try and radically alter their own lives so that, you know, to fit the constraints of the current system where we have all these massive negative externalities, it's to, at broad scale, remove those large unaccounted for negative externalities and make it really easy, trivially easy for everybody, irrespective of means and lifestyle to make good choices that help solve the problem. Okay, I want to hear your response, Peter. And then for our last few minutes, I want to talk about politics, because if we need systemic change and we don't have good leadership and we have the Joe Manchins of the world, or actually he's in a category of his own right now, holding up progress, you know, what does that mean? What does that portend, pray tell? So on the, on the large scale, I, I think what, what Daniel said is exactly right, what, what we can do as individuals. On the large scale, if we keep doubling the amount of renewable energy that we install from here on out for the next few decades by roughly the middle of the century we can actually produce 80 90 percent of the energy needed through renewables so that's that's one way but but it needs incentives you know you 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 if we are looking at how much subsidies the oil industry has received in the past and still does, if that would be shifted into other energy forms, we actually could take the pressure off the climate system, off the emissions by switching away from burning fossils to having renewable um, energy systems. And then of course, as, as uh, Daniel said, in terms of what, what is possible, for, for individuals, there is actually, if you're looking at certain areas in the world and living in Phoenix, of course, I'm in one of them where, in my view, there's actually no excuse to not have the incentives that every roof has solar panels because, you know, they, they actually can put a major boost to that transformation to, to renewables. And, you know, I have one array on, on, my, on my roof that I installed so in, in essence, I produce more energy than, than, than I need. There are issues of flattening the curve and all that kind of stuff. But in principle, we also know how to do that. So there, there are many, many ways along the lines of Daniel's and, and, and what I lined out that are ready right now to embark on and, and push forward. But leading over to what you, I think, mentioned that you want to address in, in, uh, towards the end, it does also need political decisions. It, it cannot all be driven by individuals. So the, the political system has to, has to uh, do its part because right now the private sector, in my view, is actually ahead of the political system in driving change. And yet there's predictions that in the midterms, we're gonna get more Republicans in office and they just traditionally, it's a fact, are not big supporters or leaders on you know, fighting climate change and even you know, other environmental initiatives, taking us backwards when we can least afford it. And you know, the situation in Ukraine you know, has put more profits into the pockets of you know, the fossil fuel industry, the oil companies. It's just so daunting, isn't it? Like we can't, we can't seem to catch a break. I would say independent of the parties, and of party lines. And we also see that in Europe, the political system has failed the test of guiding us into reasonable climate policies that have some teeth. And it started with Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol. We, we saw that this was, and then people said, well, that was just too rigid and you, know, you can make arguments around that. So the Paris Accord is much more flexible, leaving nations their own pathway to reaching targets. This is also not on track and it is across different political orientations. So the political system, the, the governance system in general doesn't seem to work for these kind of problems. And the question then, of course, is how do you get out of that dilemma? One way I see that that is, or one area that I see is picking up uh, momentum is the private sector. That there are quite a few companies who are moving more aggressively towards carbon neutrality, um, zero waste, um, you know, uh, less water use, things like that. 
if if we want to succeed, we, we need the political system to become more active and to be more proactive and to be more supportive of the right incentives that would lead to a change in the way we we uh, use energy and thereby influence the climate. We have to wrap up in just a couple of minutes and I want you two to get back to work because what you're doing is so important. Let's try to end on a positive note. Uh, when I was in college, quite a few decades ago or a few, yeah, <laughs> long ago, uh, environmental studies really wasn't something, you know, that was offered or I don't recall, I wasn't interested back then, but uh, I was a psychology major and boy, this takes a lot of psychology, doesn't it, to figure out. But you have, you're both at institutions where I'm sure you're seeing increasing interest and demand in your departments, in your program. So while I don't believe it's okay to just let, you know, the young people grow up and, and fix our mess, um, we, they're, calling on us appropriately, yelling at us to do our part so they can stay in school and learn. But um, is that something where you get some some hope and encouragement that, you know, the young people, as they should be, are, are most concerned? And yet, you know, I don't think it's okay, as I say, to just wait till they come of age, because first of all, it'll be too late if we have eight years for them to get into their professions and start, you, you don't turn a ship around overnight, you don't turn this mess around overnight. So anyway, just thoughts on that as we close. I mean, I think that one of the things I actually sometimes pu push back against is the notion that we have eight years, uh, because on the one hand, um, we don't have even eight years. It's already at the point where we're seeing impacts that are bad for people and for ecosystems. But on the other hand, maybe on the more optimistic side, there's no cliff in the geophysical system that we fall off of in exactly eight years or at any particular threshold of global mean warming. So, you know, the bad news and the good news is we cause the problem and we can fix the problem. And it's it's good news, you know, it, or it's, I guess I'll start with the bad. It's bad news because we're not fixing the problem and on any meaningful scale yet. You know, for all the talk we've had over recent years, net, you know, greenhouse gas forcing is still increasing in the atmosphere, and that's ultimately what matters. But on the other side of things, on the more optimistic side of things, this is not some exogenous planetary threat that we have no control over. Uh, if it were the sun that was causing it, we'd be kind of out of luck. Um, <laughs> there's nothing we could do about the sun's, you know, suddenly emitting more energy. But that's not why this is happening. It's happening because of choices that we've made historically as a society and choices that we're continuing to make as a society. And so the good news is we can, we can alter that societal calculus and make different choices and fix the problem. There's no physical climate system or technological reason why that's impossible. And if it takes 10 years or 15 or 20 years, uh, it's not like we've lost the fight. And so that's why I kind of tend to shy away from the, we have eight years language because it's both um, too little, too late, and also uh, we, we shouldn't lose hope if or when uh, we haven't magically solved the problem in eight years, because solving it in 20 years would still be an incredible success relative to the path we're currently on. And Peter, I want to hear your thoughts, but um, won't it help when we raise the eco-literacy rates in this country? You know, it really... It's, it can be astonishing when you talk to just people who are not working in the environmental community. You know, my, my normal friends don't, I, I just randomly say, do you know how many parts per million of greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere now? Hmm? Do you have any idea what the safe level is? Hmm? <laughs> you know? And it's like, oh my gosh. And, and we've just not been good environmental stewards in this country and perhaps, you know, elsewhere. That has to shift, right? We have to make, put this top of mind. <laughs> and and uh, even then. You know. I mean, there are, there are a few, a few um aspects to what, what, what we are discussing here. Uh, let me just build quickly off what, what Daniel said. I, I agree, we are in, in a way we are in negative time, but on the other side, we don't have to be fixated on the eight years, but we have to be cognizant that if we are not reaching the targets that we have set within the next roughly one decade, then the consequences that we have to battle and the, the situation that we have to solve will become more difficult. So there is an urgency factor in it, but it's not that eight years or nothing. At the same time, I often say the time is now. We, we cannot contemplate any longer. We, we know enough. We have seen enough. We are seeing more and more. So there, there is absolutely no excuse and any reason to say we have to contemplate more. Th this is the moment to act. And, and every, uh, every little bit counts, right? And every little bit counts. 
on the education, yes, we have a lack of, of, of information in the population of education in these areas. The positive thing is that if you look at movements like Fridays for Future, they are actually calling for signs to inform these decisions. There are more programs now around universities, more universities bringing them in. That It's filtering into high school, it's filtering into pre-K. So there, there, there is hope that this is becoming more widespread, better understood. If you talk to the younger generation, they are much better informed than their parents and their grandparents. Mm -hmm. The question is balancing the time. And yeah, there is no exactly defined cutoff when things won't work anymore. But we have to make sure that we understand, as Daniel said, it's in our hands. We don't have to turn from deniers to lemmings, to fatalists. We, we have options. And hopefully this younger generation, better educated, better prepared, will help accelerate that. But we have actually the responsibility. Our generations have the responsibility to help them, to facilitate them, to give them the space to do things differently than we did, rather than trying to hold them back. And the important things I think to keep repeating are the, a, a lot of this, if not all of this, is, is not reversible. You know, when, once it tips, it tips. And then there's that cascading effect, as we've talked about. And just that, you know, the window is closing to act quickly. It's now. We, yeah. But the moment is now. If, if we miss that, the, yeah, as, as Daniel said, it's not that everything will fall apart immediately, but it will become increasingly more difficult if we are not putting things in action right now. Well, thank yeah, you. I like that framing. The, the, the moment is now, I think, is a good, very succinct summary of, I think, where we are today. Now or never, I think, was one of the takeaway messages from this um, IPCC third report out of a series. So yes, now or never, right? Truly. Uh, that may be an overused phrase, but you know, never more important to application than to our planet, our life support system, which is on life support. And uh, there's a role for all of us because we can all have a positive or negative impact. I want to thank you for your roles in this um, evolving, emerging drama. <laughs> will humanity make it? Will we wake up and smell the carbon and get off our gases in time? Or will we just kind of watch it all go away. I know what I hope, I know what you hope, and I know what our viewers hope. So we hope that um, our viewers will go to uh, YouTube and subscribe to our greentv.com channel. The more viewers we get, the sooner we can start live streaming because as you can tell, there's oh so much to talk about. No shortage of um, compelling, urgent, and fascinating and interesting issues and no shortage of challenges, but most importantly, no shortage of solutionary. So thank you be, for being part of our uh, climate force. Um, hope we can call on you again. So wonderful to get your, your knowledge and expertise. And um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us. That does it for this edition of Green TV. Uh, we'll see you next time. And please tell your friends and family about this, this Green TV thing. It's not for environmentalists or not only for what I call the green crowd. It's, for, it's actually for everybody. That is everyone who eats, breathes, or drinks. So I think that last time I checked that applied to all of us. So we, we feel that way about it and hope you'll, you'll spread the word. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll take all of us.